want to finish up uh, the Python basic about files uh, handling and exception handling. So, and then uh, on Wednesday, no, no, on Thursday, we're going to have the midterm. So, uh, for the midterm, it accounts for, I think, 15% uh, of your total grade. So, I have not finished the question yet, but I think we have five questions. Uh, it's open book, so you're welcome to go Google online, find whatever resource you need to complete the exam. So we're gonna have five questions, and each question is like 30 points. So make sure you review all the Python basics. Um, so there will be four questions about the Python basic language, uh, conditional statements, uh, looping, uh, files handling, uh, exception handling. So those are the basic that uh, knowledge you need in order to build a package. Okay, and then will be one pack one question about creating a package. Okay, so make sure that you repeat the step and are very familiar how to create one and put on GitHub and uh, release it to PyPI, uh, enable the documentation. So if you forgot, uh, go back and do that. So make them should be pretty straightforward. Okay, should be easy. Um, and again, it's open book. So if you have any questions, uh, go online. And uh, if you have any concerns, uh, you can talk to me before Thursday. Okay, so five questions, 30 points each questions. And you just need to push things on GitHub and then submit a an URL, uh, just like uh, the previous lab. Questions? So after today, we'll be done with all the basic stuff. And then starting from next week, we'll be really integrating some geospatial stuff into your package, right? So basically right now, you, you should have a good understanding of how to create one, how to build the foundation, and how to push things on GitHub, how to enable documentation, and then how to do um release okay and the real hard work starts begin next week um, you have to think about what i really want to add to the package you already have the name you already have the foundation um, now it's start uh, the time to think about what you really want okay and uh, again today about file handling uh, before we get into the details i would like to show you a package that i just released uh, today um, so I spent some couple of days uh, last week during the break thinking about something that I can build and something that I wanted to build for a long time uh, but it was not possible now seems it's possible so I'm gonna show you how we can create 3d maps okay so most of the stuff that I've shown you in the past basically is 2d but there are a lot of cool stuff cool 3d on the internet and what I'm gonna show you here is exactly what I have been teaching you uh, how to build a package, how to put it on gig, how to release. Uh, the same old pro step, uh, the c procedure is the same. Uh, the most critical part is what kind of functions, okay? So I'm gonna show you where you can get access to that package. If you go to the resources, I put a link here. Uh, is, this one is called map widget. So I can just show you here what it looks like. And uh, I just put it out. I worked in a couple, uh, actually started uh, two months ago, uh, but I really uh, spent more time to the past last week and then adding functionality. Now I have a stable version that I can release that allows you to test it, okay? Right? Oh, on GitHub, all the pages, tags, right? So now when you see the GitHub repo like this, in your mind, you should know like how you implement it. And then if you scroll down, right, I have examples. This is where it gets really cool, right? 3D. Right, 3D group, one line of code, okay? One line of code. It's yeah, very easy to create, I'm gonna show you, right? And you can overlook video and all kind of stuff actually on top of that. And you're welcome to look at the source code, it's not really complicated, right? I use the same template that I show you uh, to create. And then, so the quicker stuff will be just within here. So I added the functions. So take a look at the source code. This is something that you should, in your mind, like at the end, how you create a package. So for example, if you look at this, uh, it's not a lot of lines of code, maybe 100 lines of code, but you have a couple of files, and then you can start really, um, of course this is still work in progress, it's not finalized yet, but I just wanna show you like some of the things you can do with this. Uh, so this package actually allow you to bring in any JavaScript libraries, 
and display like in Jupyter notebook, and it can do communication back and forth. So the data from JavaScript can pass back to the Python, and it can do follow processing. All the data, the, the the function in JavaScript can pass back to uh, in Python can pass back to JavaScript. Basically, you can do so-called bi-directional communication. So if you want to try it out again, right? We have talked about this. How you add the link, how you add the text, right? I can just click, uh, show you here. Uh, it take you to the website, and then from there you can look at the examples. For example, uh, right now I support five libraries, uh, but you can. Some of those will require an API token. Uh, we'll talk about more later, maybe this semester, how you can actually get an API token uh, because not everything is free. Uh, some of those are free, you don't need a license. Some of those will require license. Um, and so you can try out, for example, the Matt uh, Libre. So this one is free, uh, you don't need uh, any license. So all you need to do by simply, for example, click link. Uh, i show you some, uh, in, uh, this is JavaScript and you will see some uh, animations in here. So if you want to try it out, uh, you can just maybe open in Google Collab. Then you can just install the packages. So at the end, uh, your package need to have this kind of functionality. So when people want to try out your stuff, they should be able to just launch the web app or, or, or the notebook anywhere, or Google Collab, uh, AWS SageMaker, whatever. And then they should be able to install right, just like that. So uh, lower the barrier. So always keep in mind, how can you lower the barrier of your users? so that they don't have to set it up very difficultly on the computer, right? And then, and so less, you are welcome to add more instruc uh, instructions. Uh, I need to sign in, oops. Did I already sign in? Uh, should be automatic, so. And then you can just install the pack. Uh, again, uncommon that, uh, install the package. So you can use pip. Uh, exclamation or you can use percentage sign uh, now I think uh, even if you don't use that it's fine but uh, I would recommend it add a percentage sign so it's going to install the package to the current virtual environment it should not take very long and then I'm just going to import the library because I have multiple modules uh, I support multiple libraries and for now I'm just using just uh, the uh, Matt library so you might have heard of Macbox uh, Macbox is uh, used to be open source uh, but I think in 2020 something, two to three years ago, they changed the open source license to closed source. So people need to give, like basically uh, get a license in order to be used it. And then, so there's an open source fork, basically a copy of the Mapbox, and then a, a lot of community users actually developing. So MapLibre is essentially a open source version of uh, the library so let me oops let me delete this one just to show you right so after I install the package then I just import uh, that group. you're welcome to try it out and then let me click this one here uh, create a map right just like leaf map so very simple I try my best to make it easier so you don't need to learn multiple packages it's just one package and then you can create uh, package uh, map based on different uh, libraries. So take a look, right? Map center, latitude, longitude, zoom level, and the height of the map, okay? So this is not static, it's dynamic, okay? And think about it, one line of code, and you can do, this is just a 2D map, okay? So the nice thing about this is actually so-called interactive and bi-directional. So if I zoom into any location and then I click my mouse, right? I click somewhere on the map, then you can get, for example, the map center, uh, basically the overall the, the center of the map. So this one is from the JavaScript, okay? And you can get the zoom level, right? Uh, you can get the bounding box of the maps. You can also get the the location where you, your mouse click, okay? So these are all very useful because sometimes you want to interact with map. And then, for example, the user select something, then you can have another interface allow the user to do the computation. So this is very all very interactive. In the past, it was not possible because <coughs> it was very painful to integrate JavaScript library into Python. But now, uh, so much easier. Okay, so this is what's just one simple map, right? Just a simple base map uh, that you created. And then, if you want to do some cool 3D, uh, for now you need to have some JavaScript. So again, f uh, don't worry too much right now. Uh, I I will continue to develop and then add, make it easier to for you to add data. For well, now, just assume that you know this. So this is basically the JavaScript code. And then I just set the map to 
access the JavaScript code and now take a look pretty cool right so you're loading a video on the map and this is very high resolution and it's interactive okay so it's not static just like a, a static video you will see is satellite imagery high resolution you overlay kind of a fun video on top of that right how cool is that and next one if you want to move stuff for example I try this one again they can look at the source code it's not so complicated but you do need some JavaScript uh, again I will add Python stuff in the future so that you don't have to actually write many lines code and take a look at this looks pretty cool right zoom in zoom out and you can press your control uh, oops uh, you can zoom in you can zoom out you can rotate right and this is at a global scale uh, so uh, as long as you have the data right and this is just one of those um, you can have multiple uh, library so this is just for Mac Librate, but you can have uh, Macbox or you can even have cesium but those will require you to have a, a API token uh, try it out you can go online just like how to get a Macbox API token or cesium those are all 3d so take a look here we have buildings you can have all kind of stuff and uh, one line of call right anyone can create so if you uh, if you're able to able to install the package and you can launch notebook and then you can start doing stuff you can also install that on your local computer so just pip install uh, map widget and try it out right get some idea like right? not just for creating 3d uh, 2d you can create 3d and you can interact and then you can have some uh, web interface to do that questions okay so that's just a demo about some of the things you can do of course you i'm not asking like to have this kind of compli complicate very complicated stuff but at least you know like how to add functions how to I create a class and how to add functions to it how to release how to make those uh, animations how to embed those animations uh, into the notebooks okay you can always come back everything's open source so um, as long as you know how to learn stuff from the other packages and then just uh, bring those into your package and then make some modification it will become your own package all right so that's about map widget and next i'm going to continue with uh, the uh, the lectures so as i said today we're going to finishing all the python basic stuff so the last chapter is about uh, files handling so it's very very important because all the program that we have written so far you just write the last right but sometimes you need to get the data into your program you also need to export data from your program and this is essential especially during geospatial stuff you are you're not just creating a base map you want to load for example a shape file on your map you want to load maybe a geostation you want to load any vector data okay or you want to load some raster data how do you uh put some raster data on the map how do you uh retrieve the data or how do you read a uh, raster data set from the internet right um especially now everything is in the cloud how do you actually access the data in the cloud and then you can visualize and you can display on the map so those are very basic operations uh, that you need to know okay uh today we're just going to cover the basic stuff about text file plain text file how do you read the stuff the content from a text file and how do you manipulate the content and after that how do you export it the data out right and once you have those um you can probably change for the knowledge to do something else you can open a csv you can open an excel file you can open a swap file it's pretty much the same uh similar procedure okay and so the notebook is on the uh website i believe let me check here uh where is it uh resources uh, gos demo and then it should be on the uh, documentation python basics uh files and exception uh, handling so this will be the last one that we'll be uh, going through uh, today and uh, since i already have that on my computer i'm going to open the file but you're welcome to uh, clone this one to a computer or you can um run it on google collab uh, which whatever way you prefer and let me open this one and so this will be uh, one question in the midterm exam will be asking you how to deal with the file handling how to read the file how to for example calculate how many words within the file 
and and how how to export the data or how to write the file, um, write the content, whatever. If there any questions, ask. Okay. Um, so we're gonna go through this one, and this is the most basic one. Uh, in Python, you need to be able to read a TXT file. So. Uh, there are a lot of uh, third-party packages, but for this one, we're just using the built-in package to read. So Python has the built-in functionality to read TXT file. So you don't need any external uh, packages. Let me uncheck this one here. And uh, first, I'd like to point out that uh, it's very important. So here, for example, this is the kind of a code block uh, to read a file. And with open, Data. This is directory. This is the file path. Uh, is a file object or just if whatever. This this variable here doesn't matter. It's just like the same like for loop, right? For something in something. That one is a temporary variable. It doesn't matter at all. Uh, as long as you have the same. And so what we are doing here essentially is okay. Uh, open this file and then read the content and then print out the content. Uh, that's it. So you will see here if I run this one. Uh, let me uh, which one here DOS. One thing you need to pay attention here is you need to make sure that the file actually exists on your computer. Um, so it's based for beginners. Sometimes this can be pretty confusing. If you're running the book, uh, running this one on in Google Colab, make sure that the file actually exists on Google Colab. Because right now you see here I'm running this one. You get the content. Everything works perfectly. The reason for that because I have the file here. Because I clone the di uh, repository, I have the directory called data here, and then I have the file pi digits in here. So if I double click, I should be able to open it. Okay, but if you're running this one on Google Colab, uh, there's a different story. Okay, so always make sure you understand the differences between you are running a notebook on a local computer and you are running something in the cloud. So if I double click this one here, if I open it, right, it takes you to Google Colab, and you have to remember when you open this one. Google it only open this notebook, so okay. There's no files actually associated with this notebook. So if you click uh, on the left side here, this icon, files. Uh, on the right here, right now it's connecting. So one is is uh, I might need to close this one. Otherwise, it's uh, I think uh, Colab only allows you to run one file at a time. So uh, allocating. Uh, Okay, so on the left side, look at here. There's nothing in here. So if you're running this one, if I go through here and try to run this one, okay, it won't work. Understand? No such file directory, data, pit, uh, digit, something. So you are running this notebook in the cloud. Data on your computer is not on there. So if you really want to run the same thing, you can either use clone the library and then you can start running there or you need to upload the file so for example i can do it here you can download the file and then i can just simply maybe uh, documentation python and then the data directory and i believe it is the pi digits right i can click this one i can drag and drop here now the file is in here so in this way the file is available uh, but uh, make sure you remove this data directory or you need to create a new directory here, a new directory, and then move that into, for example, data. And then move the file into the folder. If you move that one into the directory, then it should be able to run. Or I can just simply, I just remove this one. And then run this one. It's work. Understand? Okay. So, and the next one I'm going to show you is that if you are doing it on your local computer, so this file pass here, let me come back to here. When you're doing programming, uh, it's very important that you understand the concept about absolute file pass and relative file pass. Um, most likely you want to run into this problem um, sooner or later. Because if you don't understand the differences, uh, you're going to have trouble. Okay, And this is especially important that when, for example, all the source code that I provide, all the notebook I provide, you should be able, if you clone the library, you should be able to run all the code without any problem. But if you look at this file path, this is so-called the relative file path. 
uh, red C by bypass means is the five pass state relative to this notebook location because I'm having this notebook in here and there's a directory uh, under the same um, uh, top directory that has a, di a data folder and then within the data folder I have this one so all the for example in this notebook is under the Python's directory and then the data right so this is called relative directory for your Python package that you want to develop uh, for all the noble examples you should use the relative directory don't have absolute directory on your computer so I'm going to show you what exactly is absolute directory so if you come back for example open here and this is the five pass right if you look at this one here this five pass is the absolute five pass so if I copy this one and then I come back to here if I replace for example in here and also pay attention Windows use backslash okay Linux and Mac use forward slash so this is also a very confusing part for beginners you see right now in here right uh, backslash 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 and then data API okay if you see a notebook somewhere on github and then the file pass look like this uh, that means whoever put their notebook is not really a following the best practice because if people download this notebook to their computer they won't be able to run it so the ideal situation would be whenever notebook is downloaded it run everything works fine they don't have to make any changes but if you download this notebook assume this is the one that uploaded right the five pass doesn't exist because the computer username is always going to be different okay so you should avoid using the absolute five pass anytime they have some information or five pass they indicate your computer name your personal information it's not good okay user won't be able to run because every computer is different uh, you cannot assume that the user five pass user is going to put this five pass under this directory but if it is relative that's fine because if they clone the repository all the files will be under the same structure so you should be able to run it without any problem and how about this try this one see if it works what happened what's wrong why it doesn't work what's the problem here right earlier I used the relative right now I use the absolute right if the relative works absolute should also work as well why what's the problem Unicode uh, skip code that can decode uh, bytes in position blah 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 truncated what is that why anyone <laughs> any solutions any Python users experts this will be the most basic, right? I mentioned earlier, uh, Windows X backslash and Mac, uh, or Python language, actually, most of the five parts use forward slash. So, if you're using a five parts like this, if you're on Windows, you just copy and paste. Make sure you put an R at the beginning. R means raw. And let me try if it works. Yeah, works now. R means raw. So, you're going to treat the string as it is. Because otherwise you're gonna treat the backslash n. Do you remember like print the backslash n? So the escape sign, the backslash is going to treat it as a special character. So that's why in your file pass in here, uh, right now it's gonna show you like backslash p, backslash g or something. So backslash is you need to be very careful because it's a special character in Python. In all in pretty much all the computer languages. Uh escape t escape something, right? It's not treated as forward slash. So if you don't want this one, you need to do this. Double backslash. So double backslash, double backslash here. All right. And this is very inconvenient. But if you do it like this, it should work as well. Or you can just simply change all the stuff to forward slash. Or you can direct like this. Uh, if you want. Uh, it's up to you. You can, you can actually mix forward slashes and double backslashes. But don't mix one forward slash and one backward slash. It's not going to work. Okay? So you're going to run into this problem. I'm sure you, you will uh, encounter this. So make sure you are using Windows. If you are, if you are, open, if you are passing an absolute file pass, make sure you put R 
and then double quotes or single quotes so that it's going to be treated as it is in that way you don't uh, run into problem but the best way will be just to use the relative file path so don't use the absolute and so in here I'm going to use data and then just like this forward slash and I think right now the Visual Studio Code should be pretty intelligent so for example here I can remove the file pass. They say, okay, I'm going to open a txt file. So single quotes, and then I'll just put data, uh, forward slash, uh, take a look, right? It's pretty intelligent. So I just select, enter, and you could go. And also, in um, what the reason we want to use the width, uh, we open something, and then we read something and print out something. Uh, the, this is the best practice um, because think about without the programming right you're opening a file on your computer you're doing something and you might accidentally shut down and sometimes you don't code the file properly you're going to lose all the content so in python if you use the with keywords and this is the code block when you go outside this code block this file will be automatically closed so you can think about with open a something uh, this is basically just a file handler and when you get out, it's closed. If you don't do this, uh, I can actually, so it's not a requirement. I can actually just do this. I will say a f equal to something open. Oops. Control F. Uh, not this one. Let me copy here. So you might also see something like this online. Okay. F equal to oops open a file and then I say f dot read lines or read whatever you see it's going to read the content and then you can print out whatever uh, without using the width statement you need to close the file so I can say f dot close now the file is closed because in any programming language, if you open a file, make sure you close at the end after you finish the stuff, right? And if you just use it this way, sometimes people forget to close. Uh, it might cause some memory leak or something. But if you use this statement, you don't have to use the close statement explicitly. When you exit the code block, the file will be closed automatically. And you also see here, right, this text file has the backslash n at the end backslash n backslash n means you go to the new line so if i open the file here just let you take a look pi digits right the reason that uh is go to the new line because inside the txt file when you use the programming language to read it um you will see the backslash n at the end okay so this is the simplest way to open a file using a relative file pass so you'll be like this with open as f or whatever you available in we do use f and then f dot read and then once you're outside you can do whatever you want so this is the more like all the same procedure um You can also use the for loop so you can if the file object right and then for line in line so actually automatically it's going to read the content it's going to loop through so it depends on how many lines you have you, you can use this way um but you have to keep in mind it's going to add the backslash n at the end so this is why you see this uh, another uh, empty lines in between but your txt file doesn't really have that but right? you only have three lines this one has five lines uh six lines because every line is going to add a, a new break line in here uh if you don't if you don't want the uh, break line you can use uh, r dot, uh, line dot r strip r strip means you remove all the special characters at the end so you can remove at the beginning you can remove at the end so now you become like this uh, this is another way that's very common so read the file object dot read you're going to read all the content all at once but you can also read lines read lines we're going to read all the content and then each line is going to be as an element in the list this is probably more common um, because when you read the content sometimes you want to loop through the lines and then to do something to each line 
for example, I can say uh, I have a, a TXT file storing all the names of each of you, right? And then I'm going to read each line and then I'm going to do something. So uh, this is very helpful because you can use the for loop uh, to do something. So again, the file name and then open, read lines. And then for each line, I'm going to remove the um, backslash n at the end. So now you have this, all the numbers. Um, this is how you can read a txt file using read or read lines. Next one here, this shows you basically how we can put the things together. So assume this is a txt file we want to read, right? It's being separated as three lines. How can I read this one and then join all the lines together so that you have a single number? And then you can convert the number, for example, to floating so they can do for calculation. Okay. So if you look at this example, uh, same thing, we're going to open the file and then we'll read all the lines. And we have a variable, pi string and an empty string. Then we're going to loop through the line. So for each line, uh, this is called plus equal, basically means uh, you get the content and you plus something else. So we basically uh, append uh, the string to the end and remove the empty line and then after that you should have the um, all the uh, digits being joined together right so the first one here uh, is chi string oh because you have some empty you have some like at the beginning here right because the second line the third line you also we only remove the backslash and at the end so if you really want to join this like we down um, the, the digits, you can just remove just the strip. So that means you remove on the left, remove the right, and this way you're gonna get a whole digit, uh, just one single um, floating number. And then you can see how many actual digits uh, in there. Yeah, just exactly like this one. Okay, questions? Is it too simple for you guys? Next one, right? You can find out, for example, how many digits you want, and then you can have a three dots at the end. Basically, once you're able to read the lines, you can do all kind of operations uh, you need. And so this programming uh, adds a little bit more, right? So we have the data, and then the pi, a million digits. Earlier, we only have like uh, 32 digits, but we have one here, million digits. Uh, look at this one pi a million digits how many digits can you remember for, for pi 3.14159 and that's it <laughs> okay right it actually has a million digits it's unlimited basically it's not just a million and uh, this is pretty interesting because uh, it contains a lot of numbers right so this one here this is where you can use python to uh, to do that so and the same thing, we have the file, we open the file, and then we join all the all the lines all together. And then it's a single string. And then from there, I'm going to ask you, for example, the input function, tell me your birthday. And then I'm gonna tell I'm gonna show you whether your birthday is contained within the pi string or not, right? I pay attention to this one. You're gonna have a similar example like this in your midterm exam. Okay. So I'm gonna ask you to open a file and ask you to do something within a file. So the user is going to enter something and you're going to tell me the results of the user input. Okay, so let's try out this one, see what happened, right? It's going to read the file and then it's going to print out, oh, here, at the top here, it's going to ask you enter your <coughs> your birthday in the form of uh, month, date, and year, uh, six digits. And then I'm going to show you um, the whether your birthday is contained within a pi string or not, okay? You can try it out. Just uh, if you don't, if you don't, if, 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 if you don't want to me to know like how old you are, you can just try uh, privately on your computer, okay? So I'm gonna try out for example uh, zero one three zero twenty. Uh, my son's birthday. So I'm gonna see if it was in there. Your birthday does not appear. Okay, too bad. And let me try another one, maybe just a random number. Uh, how about um, 
zero one maybe twenty eighty eight for example. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, usually it used to be pretty like at least uh, maybe uh, zero three maybe twenty ninety nine. Oh, you see, uh, your birthday appear in the first million digits. Uh, I forgot the number that I enter. But you can certainly come back to here, right? And then you just control V. Uh, control V. Oops. No control V. Control F. Uh, you should be able to search the numbers in here. You can find out, for example, how many times your birthday appear in this digit. Okay, let me see, for example, 0, February 30, 99. Yeah, you see one in here, right? Look at this one, 0, 3, 30, 99. Or maybe uh, 0, 1, 20, 88. Oh no, 83. Okay, so you're going to show you here one digit. Uh, so you can try it out, see if your birthday is contained there or not. Very simple program, right? Ideally, you should also have a for loop that allow users to enter. And when the user enter, for example, quick, then you quit the program, right? For now, you only run one once, right? But you can certainly have a uh, for loop. So here, how do you modify this program that allow the user to enter continuously until the user enter quit? What kind of things we should do here? Any suggestions? <laughs> Did we talk about this last time? Yes? Uh huh. Okay, good. So let me show you here, right? While loop. So where we should put the while loop? Maybe while, right? What? Two? Oh no! Your while loop. Your your input need to be within the while loop. So you want to put something in here, okay? You say while two, right? You have no idea how many times the user going to enter. So you should have this one here, and then uh, you should. Back, uh, put this into the core block like this, right? So, what you need to do uh, is actually you're going to accept the user input, right? So, if the user enter quick, then I'm just going to quit. I'm going to break the program. So, you need to have a stop condition. It's actually pretty simple. I'm going to just add one line here. I will say if uh, birthday equal to okay, quick, then what should we do? Say it again? Break. Break. Okay, good. That's it. So we're just adding three lines of code. Then now your program becomes something that can repeatedly uh, prompt so that user can enter continuously. So, right? So now I can run. And I can say maybe 0, 3, uh, 20, 88. Okay. 0, 9. Right, so your birthday appears, second one does not appear. Uh, you can do whatever number you like actually. It doesn't have to be three digits, I can run any dumb numbers. And then I can just type quick. See, then the program stops. Okay, so this is how you can write a program that uh, accept user input and then do something until the user stops. Okay, so make sure you understand the logic here, uh, the workflow. There will be a couple of midterm exam questions like this. So make sure you understand how to use the for loop and how to accept the user input, how to do something and how to print out the result and how to get out. Okay. Um, so this is about reading the file. Yes. I just want to clarify. The exam will be on Thursday. In class. Yeah. In, in, stay, uh, in class here. But we so, can use like our resources. Yeah. Use whatever you want. Okay. Okay. Um, as long as you can understand that you can you can copy example from the internet or copy example from the lecture notes or the notebooks um, but make sure you really understand if you have questions i go back to uh, review the uh, notebook examples and all the lab uh, or the lab assignments pretty much the same uh, stuff okay so that's about reading a file next we're going to talk about how you can actually write a file so it's pretty much similar so when we open like we open and then it's something and then you can read the line. This one here is almost the opposite, right? We read the file, but in this case, we want to write the file. So you hear earlier, we use the file object dot 
uh, read now we use the dog write and the other difference is here you have the w uh, this is called file mode mode basically means you are trying to open the file read the file or you try to read only or write only or you want to append so in python there are three modes if you hover your mouse in here it's going to show you right the mode str so makes it the mode the second parameter is the mode so if you scroll down here it's going to show you the character that's allowed by default is r r means read only right you can have the other one is called w w means going to for write and the other one is called a a means um it's going to append the content right sometimes you want to open a file and then you want to add append stuff into the file then you use the a if you use the w if you have the file already exist you're going to delete the file so be very careful careful about that because you might accidentally delete some important files uh, so i'm going to show you here let me take a look at this one pretty simple we're going to open the file and then just want to write one line of code into there so have the file name so the file does not have to exist so if you're using the w it's going to create a file for you and then i'm going to write one line so take a look here here it's basically the file that we just created uh where is it uh data programming so it's actually here right just one line of call and i can open the text file i can add some other stuff in here right control s right and if you open the file again uh it's already there so this is there's something you need to be careful because you use if you use the w more you're going to it's going to delete the file and then recreate it right so right now if i run this one again the file that we modified earlier will be gone okay so if i run this one and then you open this file again it's a new one again so be very cautious about using the w unless you know that the file doesn't exist or you don't accidentally overwrite the file otherwise you lose all the content okay so this is how you can write uh, create an empty file and then write the content to it you can write as many lines as you want right so i can open a text file i can just enter the content but if you want to do that programmatically uh, this is the way to do it right uh, this is the file pass i'm going to open the file i'm going to write one line i'm going to write the second line right so if i run this one uh how many lines how many lines you want to find uh, to find in the file how many lines I run this code block <coughs> it might surprise you how many lines two lines one line okay so in programming is a bit different right so if you open just a text editor i can probably just write one line and then just press hit enter and then i can create a new uh like like this programming you need to specifically because there's no no really they allow you to press like interactively if you want to create a new line you need to add the backslash n at the end otherwise your code will not create a new line and that's why it's going to just continue to print add to the content right so if i come back to here look at this one so this is the first line uh if you want to add a second line uh there are a couple ways you can do that i can come back to this uh double quotes before the end i can put a backslash n this is one way or i can put a backslash n at the beginning uh, either way is fine so right now if i run this one double click open you see i have two lines right same thing i can if you want to do this i can add a backslash n at the beginning so this one basically is telling python to okay backslash it makes you hit enter on your keyboard to go to the second line okay and if you want to write multiple lines i actually i can just do same at uh, the same line i can do it here Control c put in here right this is the same thing this is only create two lines so anytime if you see the backslash something be very cautious because this looks like just one line but it's actually creating two lines so if i type it here take a look right or i can have backslash t what does this mean 
How many lines you want to see in the txt file? Ba ba ba, and then backslash t. I love uh, new games. What does this mean? Uh huh. So basically, it's just one line. It's going to have a tab. So if you want this one, open it. Or oh, the tab is this is only one, but you're supposed to have. Uh, you can have multiple if you want. <laughs> you can have another backslash t. Then you'll be more obvious, right? Yeah, backslash t, backslash t, control a. Run this one again, open it, and I have the uh, multiple tab. So it's very flexible. You just need to know what you want. And this is how you can write a file. Um, you can use the W, you can use backslash N, we already talked about that. The other one here, A means a pane. So this is also very helpful. Sometimes you just want to open a file, you don't want to create a, uh, a, 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 a new file. If you just want to open the existing content and then you just write new content to it, then you open this file as the append mode, right? So now if you look at this file here, I have this one line over here. If I run this code block, it's going to open the file and then add another two lines into the code block. So now, uh, let me see here. And when I run this one, how many lines do you see in the txt file right now? All right, so earlier we have one line. Now I try to add these two lines. And how many lines in the text? <laughs> Simple, right? I have one line, I add another two lines. How many lines? Three? Are you sure? Think carefully. Let me open. Let's find out the result. How many lines? Two lines. Why? Because I have these lines added earlier, and I try to add another two lines, but I don't have a backslash and in the previous line, or I don't have a backslash and in the new line. It's going to print out to the end. So you have to be very careful. If you really want that, you want to have the backslash and uh, here, backslash and in the beginning, or you have a backslash and in the previous file that you created. Otherwise, by default. All the content you will write into the, the txt file, if you don't specifically have the explicitly have the backslash n, it doesn't contain it. So when you have the append mode, it's going to go append to the end. Understand? So this is very, uh, uh, sometimes very tricky. Make sure you understand the logic. <laughs> and so this is pretty much about that uh, writing txt file, and it's very simple and easy to use. Uh, the other one that you might want to maybe use is uh, for example leaf map so leaf map allows you to download any files from the internet and then to download to your computer so this might be helpful if you want to uh, streamline the process think about if you go to a, a web page and you're trying to download files like right, you have uh, hundreds of links you don't want to manually go through and then you click the link and then to do it by yourself you can write a program to actually automatically download all the files so I'm gonna show you how you can use leaf map to download the file. So I can just use here. Uh, this is very helpful, especially later when you try to add some functionality to your package. Uh, you want to, for example, the user can provide a HTTP URL and then pointing to a GeoJSON or something or swap file. And then the, you, you can automatically load the data on the map. So in that way, user don't have to go online, like download and then upload to the, uh, it takes time. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. So leaf map, don't map. And uh, let me show you where, for example, I can get this file. I can go to maybe the documentation and then the example, oh, no, no, this one, sorry. Uh, Geo demo, uh, documentation, the Python, and then the data, right? I have a bunch of files in here. So also pay attention. Uh, this one is also very important because uh, assume, for example, I have this uh, a million digit. Uh, this is too much, maybe try a simpler one. Uh, maybe the, how about this one? Also too much, maybe the pi digits. Just a simple one. <laughs> how about this one, okay? So when you open this file here, uh, this is the URL. If you're trying to read the URL, read this file, it doesn't work, okay? So make sure you click the raw button here because this is a web page. This is not 
pointing to the file. If you're trying to read the text from here, it, it won't work. So make sure you click this one here, the raw button. And this one is the real URL, direct URL to the file because you can download. There are local program in Python packages that allows you to read a file. If you're trying to read a file from a GitHub, make sure that you click the raw button to get the direct URL. So this is the URL I'm going to use. And then I can come back to uh, leaf map here. So leaf map dot download file, okay, parentheses, uh, single course, control V. Uh, this allows you to download the file programmatically from the internet. Okay, so here, just con uh, alt enter. You see the file being downloaded to here, Python, PyDigits, and take a look. Where is it? Let me close this one. Here. This is the file we just downloaded. So it doesn't have to be a txt file. You can download any file from the internet, okay? Uh, pretty much any file. So this is very useful. You can also download a bunch of files. If you have multiple files, you can also download all together. So let me show another one. Maybe, how about this? Let me go to the uh, leaf map website, okay? I can go to the GitHub. I need to point out that Technically, you can just right click and do download file. That's not the point, okay? We are doing programming. You want to be able to download the file program uh, programmatically. It doesn't matter how many files, it can be thousands of files, right? And uh, if you need to download multiple files, this is where the programming is going to save you tons of time. So I'm going to maybe go to examples, right? Data. And so how about this? For example, cable.geojson, right? So this is a geojson file. And uh, you want to open it. Oops, it doesn't show up. Maybe let's try another one. Uh, how about the U.S. states? Uh, U.S. regions, uh, geotation. Right. So you see here is uh, GitHub is going to render the data automatically. But again, if you want to download the file, make sure you click the raw button and get the raw URL. Control C, come back to here, and then paste the URL. Control V. And then download. It's going to download the file in here. So now we have this geojson on our computer. Okay. So this is for you to download just one file. If you have, uh, if you have a task that you have to scrape stuff online, and then you need to download a bunch of files, you can do that all at once. You can also do it in here. So assume that you use a Python package, you have to scrape a web page. You get all the links to a web page, and then I can just simply uh, download the file from. The internet. So I'm show you here. For example, I can say uh, links equal to. Oops. You can put it inside the list. Okay. So I can, for example, this is the first one I'm going to download, and then the comma, and then the other one. So I can do it here. Uh, GeoJSON. Maybe another one. Um, oops. It can be any file, so it doesn't really matter. So I'm going to just grab two links. Okay, Control C, and come back here. So now I have these two links, uh, two files I want to download to my computer. Okay, so once you have this, just run late, run this one, and then just uh, leave map dot download. Uh, now you can use this one. Uh, I probably haven't uh, updated the package. I think I added a new one, so I mean I need to. Uh, update so we here um pip install leaf map whoops i think that one was the, the function that i added uh, maybe last week so i'm just going to update the package then you should be able to see the function leaf map dot download files uh so in that way you can download a bunch of files 100 1000 doesn't matter it's going to be automatic um Okay, it's done, and let me restart my kernel. Uh, where is it? Go run. Let me just close this. Control S, move it. Uh, open again. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh. Did I lost it? Okay, here. So I'm gonna run this one again. Import leaf map, and then uh, you should be able to use like leaf map dot downloads. Right. So now you see this one. Download files. Press enter. Parentheses, and then just pressing the links. Okay, the so links like basically all the URL to your file, and then just run this one. You see, downloading. And then from this to this one, this one already exists, it's gonna skip, right? So now you have the files automatically, the cable.geojson, US region.geojson, right? So this uh, provide a convenient function for you to download any file. You can also download files from Google Drive. So you can share the link to your Google Drive, uh, the direct URL, and then you can download all the files. There's one I think here called leave map dot download. Uh, folder so you can download all the files from a google drive folder automatically uh, so if you if you want to okay so this is about uh, downloading files and next one is uh, talk about file exception handling this is also a very important topic because you are designing a program and then you are, for example you are trying to allow users to open, open a file and then display it on the map so there can be all kinds of scenarios just like uh, what we run into uh, earlier, the, depends on the Windows um, or different uh, computers. The file path, sometimes you have backslash, you have forward slash, it's all going to be different. So you need to make sure that your program is robust enough that it doesn't crash, okay? Just like you're using ArcGIS, it crashes all the time, it's not good, right? You need to improve the user experience. So what we're going to do here is to so called use the try except, and this is uh, essentially what this is about try except and then the except is just like if else if else right you can have multiple conditions because um, you can provide different input the input sometimes can be if you want to for example the user provide specific info if it is incorrect uh, you want to tell the user about that so uh, let me go back to uh, this one here just if you just type this one print out or maybe just five divided by zero right you run this one you want to run into error it's going to say division uh, by zero so this is the zero division error right it's going to show you uh, an error in here and it's not good so you if you put inside your core block that might potentially have any issues within a try block that means python is going to catch it so this is the easiest way try except and the zero division error sometimes you don't you cannot really remember you don't really have to use it if i just remove this one it's fine as well so if i run this one it's going to be the same right try and then if it goes wrong it's going to execute this code block okay rather than this one just direct put in here it, it crash your program will crash so make sure that if you program that potentially run into any issues depends on the user input then you might want to put your stuff within a code block so try basically tell pro, uh, python to okay try this program if something goes wrong do something in except okay and except you can give a warning message you can do something whatever right so once you can do for example you design a program and then asking user to enter the number if the number is incorrect <laughs> you're going to ask the user to re-enter a number right just like you are online you're trying to fill, fill out a form uh, you need to enter your email address and if you don't have an add sign in your email address it's going to tell you you need to enter something because it's invalid so this is what you can catch it um in here so let me uncomma this one and let's look at this give me two numbers i will divide them enter q to quick right while two basically you're going to loop and you get the first number if it's equal to q i'm going to break i'm going to done or uh and if it's correct enter the second number and then it's going to convert that one to an integer uh if something goes wrong you see here right the try except uh or you can type an else um if you can catch multiple conditions so except means 
it can be zero division error it can be multiply error it can be log uh, or exponential error sometimes you're going to have all kind of errors so you can accept 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 else else means if it's not specifically specifying here it's going to go to this error and that's one this one right so first number maybe one second number three and then it's going to show you it's going to divide one divided by three right point uh, three, 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 something, right? And then I continue to enter number, maybe four divided by two, you get two, right? And if I under Q, it's going to quit, right? So two. So this is how you can catch the error. Otherwise, seeing here, right? Without the try except right now, I can enter whatever the script, something like this. And then you're going to end divided by three. It's going to show you, oops. Uh, inverted literal. <laughs> I think it's supposed to catch the error. Let me try again. Four divided by something. Inverted in. Oh yeah. So right now, uh, you see here it still throw out this error. I uh, take a look. It's called very error. Because right now this problem is no longer the zero division error. And work. Yeah, I think this program is something wrong. Let me try again. So uh let me say three divided by zero is to catch the error. Okay. You see here? It catch this error because you are dividing by zero, it's coming to here. And else trying to print out a number this is wrong uh, because uh, you're going to run into some other error so you're supposed to be uh, in here is to print out okay because if you have another error then I'm going to say uh, print out something wrong going wrong okay and let me cancel this one <laughs> And then this is where you can really print out the answer. So let me show you like what what does that mean in here. So earlier we have the zero division error because you're trying to convert the number and then trying to divide them. If this you have the second number zero, it's going to catch this error. Other than that, it's going to say something went wrong. Uh, it, probably if you don't know, you can just put everything under the else. And if everything works perfectly, it's going to come to here. It's going to print out the number. So let's try this one again and see what's the difference is. Now your program should be able to handle any scenario. So I can say, for example, uh, 4 divided by 2, you only get 2, right? Oops. Uh, I think it should be like this. No else, it should be except. Um, try this one again. So now say 4 divided by 2, you're going to get 2, right? No errors, right? Uh, 3 divided by 0, you're going to catch the error. So you can't divide it by 0. And then this is where you catch the other error, right? I enter a string. This one here, when you try to run this one, you cannot convert a string to a number. And you're going to run into errors. So if I run this one, and then enter another one, divided by 4. You see? It's supposed to have say, something uh, something went wrong here. Yeah, actually, it doesn't print out. But so in this way, your program can catch all kind of errors rather than just break down. Um, so try except if you know exactly what error that the user might potentially have. You can have this one here, but it's not required. I can just something, I can totally remove this one. I can say try except. So if there's something wrong, I'm just going to print out something wrong. Uh, you don't care about whether it's zero error or user entered a string or whatever. Uh, you don't have to do that. So now if I execute it, can cancel this one and oops, press Q. So run this one again. Now I can, for example, eight divided by zero. It's going to show you like something went wrong. I don't care about whether it's zero or not, right? And I can enter this and then enter number. It's going to say something went wrong, whatever. Uh, you are still seeing the zero here because it depends on what number you provide at the beginning. 
uh, that number is always exist so it's going to print out uh, this one here questions so the try except is very important uh, you can catch error about uh, all kind of calculation or you can catch error about a file uh, something that might might go wrong then you need to put things in your try except so the final exam uh, the, the midterm exam also going to have some question about like that how do you design a program that allow the user to enter continuously and if the user enter a very invalid number you're going to tell the user that it's wrong we enter just like this program right you're trying to divide two number you want to add some numbers uh, your program should be able to uh, handle that so the next one here this is about reading a file right so the file name and then try to open the file if the file doesn't exist you're going to throw out the error saying uh, the file doesn't exist so take a look uh, this is good otherwise if you're going to have a program like this you're going to open the file and then just have these two lines without the without a try except your program will look like this okay uh, file name open the file uh, encoding basically sometimes if you open your file in different language you can you need to have the encoding but i don't have to have this so if i run this one take a look your program is going to run into error saying that the file cannot be found and this is not a good way okay you always need to make sure that you can handle that just like you're trying to for example use uh, uh word document try to open a file if the file has already been deleted it's not there you need to tell the user that it doesn't exist rather than crash because if they happen like this your program stops uh, this is should be avoided and if you provide something like this put whatever that potentially can run into errors run into this one and then it's much better also for example if you're trying to deny a program that allow user to read a large amount of data into the memory if you only have 16 gigabyte you are reading a file that's like 20 gigabyte is not going to work so in that way you need to tell the user okay the memory exists exceeded or whatever rather than just froze the computer the computer will become frozen and it's not good okay so you need to have some prevention uh, steps at the beginning um, and what else so you can split the file you can read the content you can do something uh, for example you can count how many words in within the text for example here if I write this one and it's going to show you for example how many how many words within that txt file so take a look at this one we open the file if the file doesn't exist you know do something if if it does you're going to execute this okay so you're going to open the content you're going to split split basically means split by space and if you split by space and you can calculate how many uh items in the list so in that way it's going to tell you uh how many words within this file right Twenty nine thousand. okay so for example the midterm i can ask you uh provide you a txt file tell me how many unique words in that file can you do that so this one just tell you like in total how many how many words within this file right Twenty nine thousand or something but if I ask you how many unique words in that txt file, how will you approach that? Just think about that. Okay, it might be on the midterm. I haven't decided yet, but this will be a good challenge for you to tackle, right? It's pretty simple. Uh, not simple, but you need to use in your mind. Think about how do I do that, right? Step by step. If you can figure it out, you should be able to do that, right? I'm going to open the file. I'm going to read the content, I'm going to split the file and into all the words and then probably I'm going to take out the first word and then if it exists, I'm going to add to this if it doesn't exist, if it already exists, I'm going to skip if it doesn't exist, I add to the list so in that editing, you should have a list of all the files, right? so only maybe adding a, a, another couple lines, two to three lines into the program then your program should be able to handle how many words although this is not like perfect because you're going to have all the something like this, all the uh, uh, parentheses, semi uh, semicolon, something like that. It's going to make things complicated, but uh, we don't go that far yet. But at least you should be able to figure out how many unique words within that txt file by simply split split file, split the content, and then grab each word and then see if it exists. And then you can push that to a list, 
at the end you just figure out how many words in that this then those are all the unique words within that okay so that's pretty much about it uh, you're welcome to uh, look at uh, the examples and last one here is that sometimes you don't want to you just want to skip you don't want to print out any error message you can just use this one except pass pass that if the file doesn't exist then you're just going to simply just skip uh, don't show anything but uh, most of the time you want to at least um, show the error give a warning message or something like that rather than just fail uh, silently or I can do it this way I think this is a better way that you can catch all the errors so in that way I don't need to know like all the scenarios I can just let the user the Python catch the error so let me show you what this one um, let me go back to this example here just show you this is also very popular you probably will see this sometimes uh, on the internet so like this one so while and then second example try and so earlier I just like say something went wrong but if you want to very specific about what the error it is you can do it like this uh, I can say uh, except exception is e uh, you're gonna see something like this very common in some of the program and you're gonna say here error uh, blah 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 something so what this one is doing basically is um, I can maybe have else here and then print out this one so let me show you what this one is doing so this one exception means except it's going to catch all kind of error and python is going to tell you what error it is so if i run this one and it's going to print example uh <coughs> eight divided by zero it's going to it's going to show you like division by zero okay or i can something like this press a string divided by three uh it's just going to skip uh, maybe four uh divided by two you will see here it very literal for in blah, blah 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 something so this one basically can catch all kind of errors uh, without you need to know you don't have to know what specific error Python is going to tell you so this is basically uh, they can use for all the scenarios all the time if you, your program might run into error you just say put your program within the try code block and then accept exception as E so E basically is the point that basically the error message and then you just print out the error message so this is another way you can handle uh, exceptions okay so this pretty much uh, about it um, the last example I, I don't uh, have time to go through but you're welcome to try it out if you need to use the JSON um, to uh, save the data to your computer but okay so this all about uh, the Python basics uh, so very important file handling exception handling how to read the file, how to download the file, how to open the file, how to read the content, how to manipulate the con uh, content. And so starting from next week, uh, we deal with some real data. So I'm going to give you some real geospatial data. How you can actually open the data, how you can add the data to the map. Okay, so make sure you practice, practice, practice. And uh, I think lab six, right? It's due this Thursday, uh, this Wednesday. So make sure that you finish the lab uh, so they can prepare for the midterm. Again, five questions in the midterm, uh, 30 points each one, and you're going to deal with all the basic while loop, for loops, uh, opening the file, handling the exception, and create a package. Okay, so that's all about uh, the midterm. Questions? If not, I will see you uh, on Thursday. Okay.